everybody and welcome to CBE Virtual. It's my very great privilege to welcome Dr. Mkwazi Okonjo Iwela to CBE tonight. Thank you for joining us. She is the first African and the first woman to be Director General of the WTO. Dr. Mkwazi has had a remarkable national and international career. Managing Director of the World Bank, two stints in the Nigerian cabinet as finance minister, and she has chaired a number of important international bodies. Thank you for joining us and for the time this evening. I know you're a very busy person and we're not gonna get all that much time, so I'm going to jump right in if that's all right with you. Yes, that's fine, Anne, thank you. Thank you. Thank you and uh, for for inviting me and um, let me jump right into the answer I think that if you look uh, at the history of what trade has done uh, you, you'll see a net positive in terms of world trade um, actually people forget that the WTO and its pre predecessor the GATT general agreement on on tariff and trades trade and tariffs um, were, were built 75 years ago to help integrate the world more and to create peace on the basis that if goods don't cross borders, guns will. And so this system has really delivered peace and it's also managed to lift over a billion people out of poverty. Yes, admittedly, a lot of those people were in China, but people all over the world have benefited. But there's also no doubt that some were left behind. There were poor people in rich countries who were left behind and poorer countries who were also left behind. And the question becomes, how do you use trade as an instrument for inclusion to bring those who have been marginalized back into the mainstream of, of global trade? I think that's the missing piece that people have not focused on, but of course, the, the issue is that when people are left behind, there's a lot of blame. Uh, they, they become very populist. And, uh, you know, of course, politicians listen to that and they become more protectionist. So that's the thing. That's why we need to work on the inclusion piece. Nigeria has benefited because now the biggest export Nigeria has is oil and gas. And without global trade, it would not be able to export that. And so we, we, we've benefited. That's how it earns, you know, over 90% of its foreign exchange revenues come from that. We are also now benefiting because the petrochemicals industry is springing up and the new fertilizer factory has just been opened up uh, by Dangote Industries. There's one existing one by Indorama. And they're exporting outside as well as producing for the country. So, grosso modo, yes, Nigeria has benefited, but it's not all been positive all the way. I have to say that competition has also led to Nigeria losing jobs in the textile industry, for instance. Our textile industry, where we had developed uh, some very strong comparative advantage over time, was also hit. Uh, you know, when it was uh, strongly subjected to competition from China, for instance. But again, you know, these things, you have to weigh the benefits and the costs. And I think that grosso modo, we benefited more than we do. Hmm. The WTO is the only global trade body, the only body in the world that makes rules for fair trade. The WTO makes sure that the multilateral trading system creates a level playing field for where the, there's transparency, there's predictability because the rules are there. And, and if you didn't have these rules and you didn't have members who were playing by these rules, largely playing by them, you'd have a free for all out there. And you can imagine who would lose when you have, if you have countries making just bilateral deals with each other, or even regional deals, um, th those with a smaller 
smaller countries or, or those that are poorer would lose out. So in a multilateral system, these countries have a voice, uh, especially where there's consensus approach to making decisions. And, and, and so the WTO ensures all of that. It is also the one place where you can bring disputes on trade of one country against the other. So it's a really unique place. And uh, I think it ensures fairer trade. And I want to end by telling you something which people need to know that when the WTO was created, its purpose was put as enabling, enhancing living standards, helping to create employment and supporting sustainable development. I mean, what could be more valid than that? It's all about people. So the WTO is about people. I would not agree with that. Uh, the WTO has achieved some very important uh, multilateral agreements. You know, you have the, the agreement on agriculture, you have the, uh, the uh, trade facilitation agreement, you have the export uh, subsidies agreement. So the number of agreements that are in place that the WTO has achieved, but it hasn't achieved as much as one would want. And I do not believe it's been delivering as much as it should to developing countries and even globally. I think it could do much more. So has it achieved? Yes. Is, is that enough? No. I really believe it's a place that could do more. And I also believe that you need to reform the WTO to be more attuned to 21st century issues. We, now we have digital trade. Um, you see what happened to e-commerce during the pandemic. There's a boom and that's e digital trade is the wave of the future. But yet we don't have rules underpinning digital trade. So we need to work hard and fast. I'm happy to say a group of 86 WTO members are negotiating uh, e-commerce rules. And, uh, uh, but those are some of the areas where the WTO needs to move really fast and to reform. Hmm. I think there's uh, one thing that people need to understand. It was very tough for China to become a member of the WTO. It took over 15 years, if I'm not uh, mistaken, for China to negotiate its accession to the WTO. And even when it did, it accepted some unusual conditions that other um, acceding members did not. For example, a 10 year transitional period when other members could review the way it's implementing uh, those uh, reforms and it, it agreed to and, uh, and signed on to. That's just an example. There were other special features that China had to agree to over time that were exceptional. So anyone who thinks that China got into the WTO easily is making a mistake. Mm. It, it was a very, it was a tough slog for them. Now, that being said, I think China's economy has grown much faster than anyone anticipated uh, when it was acceding in, in 2001. Um, I think at that time, I think its global GDP was about 1.62 trillion or thereabouts. Uh, um, and now we have an economy that is really catching up with the US with a GDP in nominal terms of about 15 point something trillion and the US is about 20. So the speed at which China has really moved uh, has perhaps taken everyone by mm. surprise. And there are members who are not happy that uh, the economy is still a significant uh, um, part of it, is still state led and their complaints of subsidies to state-owned enterprises, industrial subsidies. Now, what are we doing at the WTO? What we've done is when I came, I said, well, this is an issue. We want to have a level playing field for everyone trading. Let's put some evidence on the table of what's really happening with subsidies across the board. Not just with China, let's look at the issue of agricultural subsidies, industrial subsidies. We've just dealt with harmful fisheries, 
subsidies. Let's study all this. And I also went to the IMF and World Bank and OECD and said, let's do this work together so that we can put all our best brains. Once we have evidence of what's happening with subsidies, then we can see what happens to our rules, get our members to look at this, see, make sure they accept an evidence-based approach to changing things. But until we put that on the table, um, I think we have a, a bit of work to mm. do. Put it this way, the WTO has amazingly just shown that multilateralism is alive and multilateralism can be an instrument and that to me it's remarkable at a time when you say as you said and geopolitical tensions are really increasing we can't deny that the world looks increasingly difficult to operate in but in the midst of this including uh, a war uh, in ukraine as that russia so one member russia is at war with another member or started a war in ukraine and this has created a lot of tensions. You have tensions between China and, and the US, between EU and China, between EU and the US. Remarkably, we've been able to bring everybody around the same table to have a successful ministerial conference where we had 10 substantial multilateral agreements, uh, including six very important agreements, including a decision on the TRIPS, a compromise decision on the TRIPS waiver issue for manufacture of vaccines. We got a fishery subsidies agreement that has been being negotiated for 21 years. We got it done. And this was done multilaterally with everyone around the table. We got a food a declaration uh, on export restrictions and for, to, to make sure that food trade flows freely, done a World Food Program declaration to make sure that humanitarian supplies can flow down. And I could go on and on with what we were able to achieve. What does this show? That even in the most difficult times, multilateralism can work and we can bring even warring parties like Ukraine and Russia around the table uh, to agree on something that benefits the world. So I don't think multilateralism is dead. On the contrary, I think we, we should not talk very lightly of the world breaking into blocks or the death of multilateralism because economists at the WTO have actually done some modeling on this. I challenge them to say all this talk about decoupling, deglobalization, fragmentation of the world into trading blocks. Can you just take a look what this might mean? And just looking at the world breaking into two blocks shows that global GDP would decrease by about 5% in the longer run, just due to loss of technology, spillovers, specialization, economies of scale, just looking at certain factors. And the losers, the biggest losers would be developing countries. So let's be careful. The multilateral trading system is a global public good, and we must invest in it. Hmm. Put it this way, I totally agree with you that trade is becoming more and more uh, used as an instrument of uh, politics. I don't agree necessarily agree with all of that, uh, but this is what is happening. Um, but I'll tell you what, at the WTO, we've got the one place where one country that feels badly done by, by another, that they're breaking WTO rules, they have a place to come. And that's the, if, we, if, if, if it didn't exist, if we didn't have this dispute settlement system, then there'd be no place to go. And you know what that means. When you don't have it, you could have real wars breaking out over trade. So we're so happy we have that now. Our dispute settlement system uh, is not functioning as well as it should because it's a two-tier system, a panel level and an appellate body. And um, a few years ago, the appellate bodies, judges, uh, appointment of new judges were, were blocked because some members feel that they don't quite like the way the appellate body is working. But 
the panel level is still there. And amazingly, countries are still bringing cases. So there's an outlet, a valve. Uh, and once we reform the appellate body, which we've agreed to do now, to reform the dispute settlement system itself by 2024, members just agree their deadline at the 12th ministerial, then we'll be back to full functionality. But even now, with the problems we have, we're still having cases brought. And I think that's a good thing for the world. Hmm. I know developing country members, as I said, some of them have not benefited as much from the multilateral trading system as they should. And that's one of the reasons uh, that I was attracted to come here to see how we could do better. But also, so some have been left behind uh, and, and we need to look at that and see why and how we can make that, uh, make that better. So, but in, at the WTO, uh, developing countries, especially the least developed, have by right written into the Marrakesh <laughs> agreement, something that is called special and differential treatment, meaning that they can have more time to implement disciplines in any of the agreements. They can get special capacity building their situation as developing countries are taken into account. And developing countries take that very seriously and they're very uh, safeguarding uh, the, the special and differential treatment, asking for policy space to be able to develop themselves. So um, I, I totally um, agree that least developed countries and developing countries, uh, their particular situation must be taken into account uh, with respect to the rules and disciplines. And they must be given the support they need to be able to implement agreements or the space they need, uh, more time uh, uh, to implement them if necessary. That way uh, they, are, they can be better beneficiaries of the trading system. But going, looking at it more broadly, there are a lot of things that countries themselves need to do, developing countries within their own borders to benefit more from the global trading system. So it's one thing to try and make sure the rules work for developing countries, but it's another to trade more. Um, you know, we have to add more value to our products in developing countries. That's one of the things that is a problem. On, the, on our continent of Africa, you know, we have less than 3% of global trade. You know, it's even diminishing. Um, you know, we are at about 2.4% now. That's not acceptable. I see us being able, sh we should be able to double the, the share of global trade we have. But to do that, we need to manufacture more, add value to our products develop certain industries that are missing, trade better with ourselves. When we even take advantage of this African continental free trade agreement to trade better together and to trade better with the outside world. So why are we exporting so many things without adding value? Those days are past. We just had a session on cotton uh, here today, you know, we have the group called the Cotton Four, you know, from the Sahelian countries whose main export is cotton. And of course, they are battling with, you know, agricultural subsidies in some of the rich countries that uh, make it difficult for them to compete, which is another subject that we are trying to battle here at the WTO. But one of the things I said is, why are we, let's add value to this cotton instead of exporting it either raw or gin. Let's turn it into garments. We have a population of 1.4 billion. Why don't we create within our own continent our own cotton industry that we can consume? If we start doing that, why can't we export these garments outside? In fact, some of our cloth is already used, being used by designers outside to make dresses that are costing so much. Why don't we do it for ourselves inside? So there are some of these things. I'm just using that as an example. Another area is pharmaceuticals. Why are we importing 95% of our pharmaceuticals on the continent and 99% of vaccines? Why don't we create an industry 
that serves us but can also be exported. We are now exporting fertilizer from Nigeria, for instance. You know, we can create industries that can, that can enhance our exports, but I believe strongly we can only do that if we add value. Uh, thank, thank you for asking. Um, I am not trying to sell my book, but I wrote a book about it called Fighting Corruption is Dangerous and uh, by MIT Press. So that really contains the stories of the various types of things that happened. Um, but really what we are trying to do with the support of the president, both presidents I served, really supported this fight against corruption. President Obasanjo the first time, President Jonathan the, the second time. I never felt I was held back from trying to um, do whatever necessary to fight uh, corruption. And we try to bring probity to our public finances. I'll just give one example that I wrote about in the book. Um, when I came back to be finance minister the second time, uh, the director of the budget immediately showed me that what we were paying to oil marketers, you know, Nigeria has this interesting situation where we export crude oil, but we, we bring in refined oil because our refineries only serve about a quarter of our needs. And of course, we're subsidizing the pet petrol at the pump. So we, when marketers bring it in, you know, they tell us we calculate how much we owe them in subsidies, and then we pay. And we noticed that the bill for subsidies had gone up so much from what it used to be. When I left government the last time, it was about $2 billion. And I came back a few years later, and they had already paid out $11 billion equivalent in subsidies. So clearly something was going on. You know, and I asked the permission of the president to audit these accounts. Uh, and he gave the permission. So we brought in a team of 15 forensic auditors, bank inspectors, uh, and it was led by a brave young man who was a, a managing director of one of our banks, Saige Mokwede. And they spent about six weeks really examining these, these accounts and physically inspecting where the oil had been brought in and looking at where, when the ships came in, how come, we are paying so much. And uh, some of the things they found were really interesting. For instance, you know, there was one time, you know, Lloyd's Register in London tracks every ship in the world. So in one instance, a marketer said they had brought in oil on a particular ship. But it turned out the time they said that ship was bringing oil in Nigeria, they were actually in China. You know, so things like that, uh, you know, they were able to track. So we were able to determine that out of the 11 billion we, we audited, about $2.5 billion uh, were, were fraudulent uh, claims. Mm. So with the backing of the president, we said we were not going to pay the marketers who were claiming this, that money, because it was uh, fraudulent. Um, and that really uh, led us uh, to a few consequences, which I wasn't really thinking about at the time. One of the consequences was my mother was kidnapped. Um, and, and how did we know it was oil marketers behind it? Because the four young men who kidnapped her and kept her for five days, uh, oh. when she asked them, you know, why, why are you holding me? They said, because your daughter did not pay marketers their money. Uh, so it was a horrible experience. Um, you know, she was taken from a home, taken to the middle of a forest, held for five days with no food and, and just a bit of water. And, and so I thought that this was um, one of the most difficult moments of my life to think she might not come back alive. Um, but the president, everybody, the police, everyone was helpful, the army, everyone contributed a manhunt. Um, I think on the fifth day of captivity, uh, she mm -hmm. was able to, you know, es escape. I think the heat got too much and she ran through the forest where she was held until she heard sounds. Mark you, my mother was 83 at the time. Oh. So you can imagine an 83 year old woman going through this. So that was one of the worst moments of my life, I must confess, you know, and I'm not going to be brave about it. You know, I was asking myself, really, I mean, 
you know, if I knew that my mother's life was what would be at stake, would I be able to do this? I'm not sure. Because everybody wants to protect their parents, not be a cause of their demise. But I was exceedingly lucky. My father was amazingly supportive and she came out alive. So that was uh, one incident. I also write about threats to my own life uh, um, that were that you know were very real. Um, but thank God, also we're able to manage that. Um, but the point is, is this, and let me just say, you know, that it wasn't just because uh, Konjiwala fighting uh, corruption. There are other people within the system. There was a, a team of people working with me. There are brave people within systems fighting. And I think we must all ask ourselves, fighting corruption in our countries begins with you. Mm. You have to be willing to say no if you're asked to give a bribe. It starts with you. You have to be willing to out those who are trying to do this and I know it is not an easy thing, but you know, it is not just some distant fight for some government, uh, it's all. We have to fight petty corruption. We have to fight grand corruption, which is what happens in, a lot in our countries with all the instruments. What I try to show is we won some, some battles and mm -hmm. we need to show those battles can be won so that those who are stealing, because that's what corruption is, and diverting resources that should go into taking care of the poverty in our countries. They don't, if they don't feel they can get away with it, if they see that there are people who are willing to really go all out. That's all I say. So I believe corruption can be fought. You know, corruption is a two-way street. Those who take the money usually take it out of the country uh, to put somewhere else, either to invest in real estate or other uh, property or just to put it in bank accounts in several countries. So I'm saying that those countries whose financial systems are recipients of this money, in a way, are equally guilty. And just measuring uh, having an index of corruption for those countries that are senders, there's a supply and demand side to corruption. Okay, we are on the supply side, but there's a demand side. If you don't have the financial systems in these countries that demand these resources and take care of them, perhaps there would be nowhere for them to go. So why don't we also develop a corruption index to measure those countries and who is the cleanest and who is accepting this money? That's what I mean, because until we have this two-way fairer evaluation of what's going on, you know, when you talk corruption, people immediately jump and think of developing countries and African countries. In my country, for instance, Nigeria, 99.9% .9 of people are honest, hardworking citizens, and I love my country. It's one of the most exciting in the world, even though we have so many problems. You know, they're honest people. And then there's a tiny minority that is not. So why should a country accept money? Money is siphoned from, from public resources and keep it and not ask quite the questions it should. Let's develop an index to monitor these countries that accept this. Well, you know, I, I think that we, when I was working, for instance, when I was at the World Bank, we, we through the experience I had and with the help of others, we, we started something called the STAR Initiative, the Stolen Assets Recovery Initiative, trying to work with countries to return those stolen assets. So that's not developing an index yet, but trying to at least get our money back. Based on the experience we had in Nigeria under President Obasanjo with his push and support, we were able to get half a million dollars, half a billion dollars back from Switzerland, for instance. And these, this push and shining this light also made the Swiss to look at their laws and to start being more transparent about monies uh, received. Um, hmm. So recovering, trying to recover monies around the world is very difficult. It takes years. Once these monies get into the bank accounts of these countries, it's difficult to get them out. But I think that was part of where we had some success. Now, developing the index, I've 
talked to Transparency International when they invited me to talk. And I think that's where you got this because I put it to them at their annual conference when they invited me that let's also try to do that and develop this index. Maybe when I finish with the jobs I'm doing, if no one has done it, I'll have a go. <laughs> <laughs> obviously have not won the war in my country. Uh, you know, let's say that in Nigeria, we still have serious uh, problems. Um, and that is why I think it's important. But, but at least people know that the examples uh, that you can fight corruption, you can out people who are doing things, bad things, you can, uh, uh, there are weapons and things you can, you can use. So, but for a country, I mean, South Africa has had a very institutionalized, I see South Africa as a country which has relatively strong institutions. So it's a pity, you know, that some of the institutions have been subverted, uh, you know, to allow this corruption to take place. You can't really fight corruption on an individual basis until you have the institutions that can deal with it. And that was another thing I pointed out in my book. At the end of the day, you have to have an independent judiciary uh, that, that is, that is uh, trusted by the people. Uh, you have to have agencies willing to, and, and, and a judiciary willing to uh, uh, arrest and try the people who are corrupt. You know, you have to have a police or whatever systems, criminal investigation systems. You have to have in place mechanisms, financial mechanisms that stop people from being able to access public resources. That was actually one of the successes we had in the country in putting in a place a financial management system, a government integrated financial management system and a personnel system that was computerized better than what we had before that at least mm -hmm. diminished the amount of corruption. They did stop it all. I'm not saying it did, but it substantially diminished that. So South Africa has the ability to do some of those, putting in system rules and mechanisms now that we have technology that really minimizes uh, access. So that's one of the pieces of advice I gave. If you do that, if you have strong institutions, uh, and especially an independent judiciary, you have the ombudsman, you have that, we didn't. Uh, those that are willing to out uh, and are seen by citizens to be fair. And then above all, we have to look at our political systems. I also saw that a lot of the corruption that comes in is based on, you know, it takes money to fight elections. And where do you get that money from? Sometimes political corruption is also linked. We need to look at our political systems and to ask ourselves, are they fit for purpose for the countries we live in? And so we need to clean up some of these things. So it's a deep fight. It's a long-term fight. But I also think that there must be a change in values and attitudes. And we have to start with our children in our schools. It's not a fight for just now. Now we've seen there's a problem. We must start, start inculcating in our children the right values, what is right and what is wrong. If you see someone who is suddenly rich, and you know that they haven't worked for their money, do you ask the right questions or do you embrace them in their fancy car and, and ride the car with them without saying, hey, how did you come about this? We ourselves must have the right values and teach our children those values. It starts with us. Hmm. Oh, there have been some senior. Yeah, senior politicians, former governors uh, mm. that have been to jail. Sometimes they didn't stay very long, but at least they were yeah. prosecuted and, and yeah. put in jail. There are not very many, I have to tell you that. We have a, a very big fight in my country to mm. really get corruption under control. Uh, so the fight continues, Aluta mm. continues.
first, let me say that it was an absolute honor to be asked by President Ramaphosa to join this team. I was a member of the team before I took this job. And, and since I took the job, uh, in fact, since I started fighting uh, um, the competition for this job, so for almost two years, I've not been active. So I can't really comment. I can comment on when I was there. We had some really fine people in that team. I was really impressed, especially some bright young economists, not afraid to challenge the system and put the right analysis on the table for the president, even when it might not be palatable. So yes, that team is a great team, is doing a good job the best they can. You know, so I don't know, recently I've not uh, been uh, part of it, so I can't comment, but when I was there, yes. I thought the president did an excellent job in putting the team there. But let me focus, one of my children is a poet. Uh, and and uh, when I was uh, young, I used to write poetry, yes, and I love poetry. Um, so that is true. <laughs> I love reading, I love writing, I love uh, poetry. Um, but I haven't written any recently. I've been writing books. And my latest books, book is I wrote with Julia Gillard, the former Prime Minister of yeah. Australia. And it's called... Uh, Women and Leadership, Real Lives, Real Lessons by Penguin Press. I really recommend it because it, it we interviewed some of the women leaders you know today, like Jacinda Ardern, Hillary Clinton, uh, Christine Lagarde, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, Joyce Banda, uh, women who have led Theresa May to find out what is their life experience. Because as a, a leader, woman leader myself and Julia, we were talking to each other as friends and found even though we come from really different cultures, we shared similar experiences in our leadership journey. And we thought, well, maybe we are peculiar. Let's talk to some other women leaders and see what can happen. And it was a really fun project. We did it, we turned it into a book. And uh, that's, that, uh, that's been the latest one that was published just before I took the job. So, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I look forward to reading the, the, your new book. Thank you for spending time with us. Good luck in the WTO and more power to your arm. And we're delighted to have had you on our platform. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Anne, for having me. And good luck. Great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. This interview, this conversation is over, unfortunately. Dr. Nkosi has another <laughs> commitment.